Let the people of God say amen. amen. Let the people of God say amen. amen. And one more time for the Holy Ghost, let the people of God say amen. amen. We thank God again to be able to come back to a place that I like to call another home. Amen. amen. And with people that I call family. It's truly good to be back, and this is the first time I get to come back as the senior pastor of Solid Rock Community yeah. Baptist Church. <laughs> and if you guys had told me it was going to be this difficult, <laughs> no, but God is good. Amen, amen, amen. Truly, it's good to see so many of you, and you know what I like to say, if you say amen, I won't be long. <laughs> Okay, I've got some hecklers already. <laughs> Amen. I do have the Lord. He deals with me. And this is my scripture, but he wanted me to look at it from a different way. Because um, children of Israel, and I bring you greetings from Solid Rock. Amen. I bring you greetings from Bishop Curtis Shared. I thank God for my wife here. I thank God for my good friend Carlos here. Amen. Amen. And the people of Solid Rock extend their love to you. And we invite you in advance to our cookout in August. <laughs> Amen. So we will send you the date. <laughs> okay. But I love the word of God and God's people were in a bad place in this scripture, in this lesson. They were in Babylonian captivity, and they were severely depressed. And they asked God a, a question because they were challenged to sing one of those good old songs of Zion. And in the fourth verse, they say, how shall we sing the Lord's song? In a strange land. That's their question. But I want to go to Ezekiel 16. And I just want to look at a few verses because this is going to take you to the heart of the matter. And <clears throat> this is God speaking to them. Ezekiel 16, chapters, I mean, verse 16, verse 6. And God said, and when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Dropping down to verse 15. But thou did trust in thine own beauty. There ends the reading of God's holy word. Father God, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Father, you are indeed an awesome God, and you're so worthy to be praised. So we thank you right now for this opportunity, knowing that we're not worthy, Father God, because I'm a man that is undone, a man with unclean lips. But Father God, I did not call myself, but you called. So Father God, because you called, I'm leaning and dependent on you. Father God, speak to the heart of your people today. Let your word be illuminated, Father God. And let it go a long way in kingdom building. Let it go a long way in restoration. Let it go a long way in edification. Let it go a long way to salvation. We thank you, Father, and we give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. Let the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, be found acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer, my all in all. In the matchless, mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. And because my focus has shifted, my title has shifted. And I just want to make a statement for you today. Don't blame God. Don't blame God. I have the, had the privilege of working for the state in Department of Mental Health for close to 20 years. 
before um, I started my real career. But during that time, I ran into a lot of individuals who had a hard time taking ownership for their actions. And so they like to, I call it fault find, in every area but within themselves. And the longer that I, I, I've been living, the more I continue to see the depth of the depravity of man. Say so we live in an almost immoralist society that puts no value on the holiness of God and the righteousness he, he wants for mankind. What values do we hold to be true as a nation anymore? Where are the ethics in today's society? We're truly living in a dog eat dog world where the strong survive and the weak continue to fall by the wayside. Narcissistic behavior is at an all time high. People are running around with an inflated sense of their own importance. You see more grandiose and fantasy based behavior than you've ever seen before. That's why on every channel you can see a reality TV show. And some of our lives are reality TV shows. People are constantly thinking more highly of themselves than they ever need to think. If you don't believe me, then just look at what's happening in the politics of our nation. The presidency of the United States of America, a position that was once revered and honored, now has become something that holds little honor in the subject of late night talk show host jokes. My brothers and sisters, this world in which we live in has reached an all time high when it comes to the debauchery of mankind. I said the sanctity of life has little or no value in today's society. Another man was killed last night on the streets of Springfield. The city of Chicago has been renamed Chirac because it has more murders and killings than both wars in Iraq and Afghanistan put together. Drunk drivers are still killing folks in the street every day. Drugs are still taking the lives of people each and every day. Human trafficking is still happening in our city and across our world every day. Babies are still being abandoned and abused in our world every day. We live in the richest country in the world, but children are still going to bed hungry every day. We live in a country that spends more on incarceration than education. So we live in a country that spends more on our military defense budget than on our health care budget. We spend more on a cruise mis missile than we do for the cure for cancer. I said my brothers and sisters misplaced priorities have our world at a point of utter chaos and calamity. The end results have produced individuals that have no moral bearing and who will never take responsibility for their own actions. I've never met so many people who won't take ownership for what they do because it's always somebody else's fault. If I get addicted to tobacco, it's the tobacco company's fault, even though they put warning labels all over those packages of cigarettes. If I leave a bar drunk, it's the fault of the bartender because he should have been monitored to me a little bit closer. If my coffee's too hot and I spill it on myself, then I can sue Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts. Kraft Food Company was sued for putting trans fats in their Oreo cookies because they were selling them to children who became overweight. Nobody wants to take responsibility for their own actions anymore. I said, if you tell me, amen. amen. <laughs> it's not my fault if I get addicted to prescription medicine. It's not my fault 
If I get a mortgage that I can't afford and then they end up foreclosing on me because I couldn't make the payment. It's not my fault if I become a pedophile because I watch pornography on the internet all day long. It's not my fault if I become physically abusive to my loved one because I saw my father do that to my mother. Everybody has an excuse to why it's not their fault and nobody wants to take ownership for their actions anymore. <clears throat> the saddest part of it all is that we would even want to blame God for the decisions and choices that we make for ourselves. Christ Presbyterian Church, I, I just stopped by this morning to let you know that it's not God's fault. And we can't blame God. I don't know about you, but I get tired of hearing excuses about if God loved us. Then there wouldn't be any terrorism. There wouldn't be any murders. There wouldn't be any natural disasters. There wouldn't be all this gun violence. There wouldn't be any child abuse. And you know that list goes on and on and on. I get tired of hearing how the church is to blame. And if the church did this and the church did that, then we wouldn't be in the shape that we're in. But I just stopped by this morning to let you know that it's not God's fault. And you can't blame God or the church for the condition that you found yourself in. My question is, how can you blame God for your condition? When you didn't consult God, when you made your decision. God says there's only one way to bring healing to the land. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, he says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. The only way this world is going to change is when we stop casting blame and start taking ownership for our own actions. I constantly hear more complaints than I ever hear solutions. I constantly hear about the problem with the church, but I never hear about what you're going to do to fix the church. And there should never be a complaint coming from your lips if you aren't investing in the church according to God's word with a tithe and an offering. How can you complain about something that you're not willing to fully invest in? Okay, I'll save that one for... I'll save that one for Solid Rock. But sometimes God says enough is enough. That's why today's text is so important. It's important because it causes us to remember the root cause of the problem. And the problem is not God. Tell yourself, the problem's not God, but the actions of sinful man. In today's text, Ezekiel is given the difficult task of reminding God's people who find themselves in Babylonian captivity that it's not God's fault. And we have to stop blaming God. Jerusalem, the holy city of God, is desolate and it's in ruin. The majority of God's people now find themselves in captivity in Babylonia. Remnants remained in Jerusalem, but the majority of God's people find themselves under Babylonian rule. The holy temple of God has been destroyed, the temple was looted, and the things of God now have been taken even into Babylon. God is being mocked by the Babylonians and his people find themselves doing hard labor in a strange land. One might ask the question, how could God let this happen to the apple of his eye? The nation of Israel in his holy city, Jerusalem. How could his holy temple become desolate and lie in ruin? The place of the holy of holies, the place that the Shekinah of glory of God resided and it now lies in ruin. Surely God, who's omnipotent, could have prevented this tragedy from happening. Why would the almighty God, who loved his chosen people so much, allow this horrible thing to happen? That's the question that was being asked of those captives in Babylon and those remnant who remained in Jerusalem. 
They asked the question of themselves and ultimately put the blame on God like it was God's fault. They completely forgot that because God is a loving God, he allows man to have free will and make decisions and choices for themselves. I said, God, who is a loving God, who wants man to choose to love him by their own free will. Angels aren't free will beings. They have no choice. But God wanted man to choose him out of his own free will, whom he would serve and whom he would love. I said, the will of God is that we would choose him. But the love of God gives us a choice. So while they're pouting and sulking in Babylon, for them it had gotten so bad that they wouldn't even sing the Lord's song in this strange land. We read it earlier. Psalm 137 says they wept by the rivers of Babylon and they even hung their harps up on the willow trees. The pity party was now in full effect. And blame was being cast everywhere but in the right place. And I say, isn't it amazing how we can blame others when we find ourselves in a bad situation but fail to realize where the real blame belongs? I think that casting blame on others has been put in our DNA ever since that first sin in the Garden of Eden. After eating that forbidden fruit in the garden and after being confronted by God, the first thing that happens is that Eve blames the snake. Then Adam ultimately blames God because the woman who God gave him caused him to eat the fruit. The only one who didn't have anyone to blame was the snake, the devil himself. It wasn't God's fault then, and it's not God's fault when we fall short and sin fills our lives. Blame belongs to the one who willfully chooses to transgress God's will for their life. If you do it, then you need to own it. Denial doesn't make anything better. It just continues to make things worse. Houses and cars can't be the only things that we like to take ownership of. If you do it, you need to own it. Don't make it worse through denial. And denial is not just a river in Egypt. Stop trying to alter your reality by casting blame on others. It's your fault. And if you're going to get back into a good relationship with God, then we need to own some things that we do in our lives. The prodigal son, he owned his right to living and was willing to admit his transgressions when he came back to his father's house. And thanks be to God, he received more than he could have ever expected because instead of being a servant, he was restored as a son because he didn't cast blame, but he owned his transgressions. And that's the very reason why Ezekiel had to make this truth known to God's people. See, they would never heal as a nation and as a people if they continued to deny their truth by casting blame instead of taking ownership. You might have your version of the truth, but God knows the truth. And God, through Ezekiel, was going to tell them the truth. And if we really love folks in our lives, we need to tell them the truth. Truth always starts by remembering the beginning of the story. And when you go to the beginning, then it's easy to see what went wrong. God told Ezekiel to tell the truth. He said, son of man, tell Jerusalem about their abominations. And God uses a wonderful illustration of a relationship between a man and a woman to point, to make his point to show how he treated her and how she treated him. God doesn't view us as casual acquaintances, but God views us as a personal, intimate relationship. 
See, that's where so many fail because God wants a relationship. But all we want is an acquaintance. God wants something serious while we just want something casual. God wants something that's permanent and forever while we just want something that's every now and then. God's people didn't value God's relationship with him. That's why their actions became an abomination to him. You know how that is. If two people are in a relationship but with each other and, and one person values that relationship more than the other, then someone's bound to be hurt. That's why Ezekiel had to remind them of their beginning and their birth. God had to remind them, I know where you came from. I remember you from the time of your nativity or your birth. I know how you were born in the land of Canaan and how your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. God was telling them, your parents should have been conquerors of the land that I gave them, but your parents became tenants and beggars in the land of promise because they didn't conquer and utterly destroy the inhabitants of the land. So now your parents are Amorites and Hittites, and they didn't even want you. It's in the word. He tells them, from your birth, from the day you were born, they didn't even cut your umbilical cord. They didn't even wash the blood or other secretions off your naked and exposed body. No one washed you to make you clean, and no one salted you to make your skin smooth. No one picked you up in their arms to swaddle you. In fact, no one even had pity or compassion on you. And on the day you were born, you were abandoned and cast out and despised by everyone that saw you. But when I passed by and saw you in this sinful, polluted condition, I said, when I saw you covered in your own blood, when you were still in your own blood, I could have walked by. But I said, live. While you're still in your own blood, I said, live. When your situation was going to bring doom and destruction to your life in ruins, I said, you will live and not die. Your sinful state had you ready to die, but I had compassion on you. And instead of death that you deserved, I gave you life. And I wonder, does that sound familiar to anyone in here today? That's not unlike the day in which we were born. We were shapen in iniquity and in sin did our mothers conceive us. That's why we can say we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the truth that God knows. That's our real reality, just like it was for Jerusalem and the people of God. Sin had them ready for death. But when God passed by, death turned into life because God had compassion on them and extended unto them grace. And I don't know about you. But that sounds like some real good news to me because that sounds a little bit like Calvary when God extended his grace to you and to me. But I have to go a little bit further because the story is not over there yet. And not only did God give them life, he gave them life more abundantly. Y'all going to help me in here. The text says he caused her to multiply and increase as she grew up. God said, I, I brought you a long way from when you were naked and bare. Now you become a beautiful woman, even to the age of love or maturity. And now as I pass by you this time, I no longer see a baby headed for destruction, but I see a woman who I want to give my love to and covenant with. God said, you become one who I want to have a relationship with and give my promise to. God said, my love washed all the blood from you, 
My love anointed you with oil and set you apart. My love clothed you with and with embroidered works. My love covered you with fur. My love dressed you up in fine linens. My love put you in silk. My love gave you jewels, bracelets, earrings, necklaces, and my love even put a crown on your head. My love sanctified you, and my love set you apart. It's in the word, y'all. My love. Had you decked out in gold and silver in the finest clothes. I said, my love gave you the best food you could ever have. And because I loved you so much, you were exceedingly beautiful and you prospered in the kingdom. Because of my love, the word of your beauty spread throughout the world. The heathens even knew about how beautiful you were because of my love for you. Because I loved you. Not only did I save your life, I picked you up, turned you around, and placed your feet on solid ground. What a testimony of the love that God can do. Ezekiel was telling them, before you cast blame about the condition that you find yourself in now, God wants you to remember where you were in the beginning and what God has done in your life. It would seem the story should have had a happy ending, but that's not what happened. They did what we still do, Brother Jody. They let their butt get in the way of their victory. Instead of enjoying their relationship with God that was founded on God's love and his grace for them, the Bible says they let their butt get in the way. Verse 15a says, but thou didst trust in thine own beauty. And the rest of the story is a wrap. You can read all the graphic details for yourself. You can read about how inappropriate their behavior came. You can read about how disrespectful they became to God, the one who loved them so much. You can read about their depravity and immorality. And it all came because they believed the hype and they trusted in their own beauty. They were given chance after chance, but they refused to get right with God and take ownership for their actions. I said, my brothers and sisters, God's only going to take so much disrespect God's only going to wink at our sins for so long. And even the patience of God is going to wear thin sometime. That's why this world needs to pay attention to the signs of the times because judgment is soon to come and the rapture of the church is imminent and apparent. Take God's love for a joke if you want to. Just like Jerusalem in the text today, it won't be God's fault. And you can't blame God when you're facing the judgment. You can get caught up in an altered sense of reality if you want to. And trust in your own beauty or your own abilities. You can be under a strong delusion if you want to. You can put your trust in your finances. You can put your trust in your education. You can put your trust in the friends you have. You can put your trust in your strength and good health. You can put your trust in your youth. But I guarantee you that none of you will be able to save you in the judgment. You won't be able to blame God. Just like Jerusalem had to face reality when they found themselves in Babylonian captivity. It's not God's fault. God gave them life when they should have had death. God cleaned them up when they were covered in blood and the sin that polluted their lives. God caused them to multiply and be set apart when destruction was knocking at their door. God's love gave them the benefits of his relationship, but their pride rejected God's love and caused them to trust in themselves. God sent Ezekiel to tell them to stop the blame game. Take ownership for your actions. See, it's not God's fault, but it's your fault. You can't blame God because you chose to worship idols instead of God Almighty. 
You can't blame God because you chose to sacrifice your children in the fire because you wanted to worship Molech. You can't blame God because you left your first love and you played the harlot with idols and other nations. If the story ended there, it would be the most sad story. But I need to let you know, there is some really good news in the text today. And you have to go way down to verse number 60 and 61, where God tells them, if you just remember thy ways and be ashamed or take ownership for your actions, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. And I don't know about you, but that is the good news. And that's the good news I'm going to end with. The love of God is truly amazing. Even when his people committed horrible atrocities against God, the love of God still provided a way back into relationship with him. And I don't know about you, but that's enough to shout about <laughs> right there. Y'all can go on. <laughs> when you take ownership for your action, no matter how bad you think they might be, God has a way for you to get back into relationship with him. When you stop blaming God for your situations and own your situations, the love of God is right there waiting for you. I said, when you stop looking to find fault in others and put the fault on yourself, the love of God is right there waiting for you. See, the same God who didn't walk by Jerusalem while they were covered in their own blood is the same God that won't walk by you when you need to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. I said, the same God who washed the blood off Jerusalem in their birth is the same God who will cover you with the blood of Jesus when you're born again. I said, the same God who was willing to receive Jerusalem back even after turning her back on him is the same God that's willing to pick you up when you fall and restore you back to his family. That's why this world can never put blame on God for their actions. When God gave this world his best and his only begotten son. That's why this world can never say that it's God's fault that evil is running rampant in the world. Because God sent Jesus not to condemn the world, but to save the world while we are yet in our sin. I said it's not God's fault. If you choose not to accept his free gift of salvation that was bought for you out on Calvary's hill. I said it's not God's fault if you choose to accept the penalty of sin when Jesus took your sins and bore them as his own and died out on Calvary's cross. I said it's not God's fault if you choose a devil's hell over God's glory because over 2,000 years ago, early that Sunday morning, God raised Jesus with all power in his hand and he took the sting out of death and took the victory from the grave. I said it's not God's fault if you choose not to live a life of abundance. When Jesus came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. I said it's not God's fault if you choose to live a life of war instead of life of peace. When Jesus told you peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. I said it's not God's fault if you choose sorrow over joy. When Jesus told you that not only can he keep you from falling, but he can present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. It's not God's fault if you're limited by your own choices. When Jesus said that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Don't blame God for the condition of your life. When he told you there's a more excellent way. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by him. Don't blame God for your loneliness. 
Because Jesus said, lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. Stop blaming God. It's not God's fault. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Whatever you do, Lord, don't take your joy away from me. Whatever you do, Lord, don't take your joy from me. Church, we have to tell this dying world to stop blaming God and take ownership. God loves them so much that he sent his best and he sent his only. Don't blame God. It's not God's fault.